is the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message, or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got Chris Holmes. So welcome onto the show, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, the pleasure's all mine, Chris. So before we get started with t- today's episode, Chris, for the people that don't know a lot about you and obviously your business, the, here's your opportunity to kind of give them a brief description. Sorry. You're good. <laughs> all right. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, of course, um, uh, my name is Chris Holmes. I run a production company, and that includes like photography, videography, audio, animation, and much more journalists. And we're all about making a dream possible. It's like you either we're helping you capture a dream or making a dream a reality. So helping you capture your dream, things like, you know, fa- uh, good dinners you want with your, me- uh, your family, weddings, you know, graduation pictures, or making your dream a reality. We're talking about like uh, short scripts or, you know, skits you want from YouTube you know, audio production and things like that for entrepreneurs or other creators like me and yourself so we can get that exposure into the social media platforms and like that. And in terms of the, the likely people that you're going to work with, Chris, now, is obviously going to be a wide spectrum. So for the, what will come from the athlete, the graduation perspective now for like high schoolers, do you work in the realms of college, uh, college sports, high school sports, as well and doing videography from that perspective. Yeah. So like I keep the business pretty broad and the reason why I do that because I know there's so many different things going on and that's why I have a team of photographers and videographers on there because you know we have sports like you said from like from the lower le- uh, grades from like middle school all the way from to the colleague and things like that and hopefully I get into opportunity to get in the professional level and kind of like take some things like that but it's all about documenting you know that, um, that grind and ambition, you know, capturing a dream as you're trying to go and take it to the next level and things like that. And for for the brand perspective now, Chris, for, for any athlete listening, uh, somebody aspiring to growth in any business facet, what, from your perspective, is the best way to go about doing that? Would it be showing, because if we come from the example of the athlete, everybody sees in front of the camera so right. the field action that's nothing extraordinary what can an athlete do to differentiate themselves from the crowd and that, i could you could probably make that generic in terms of the answer so i, I haven't made it to the pro level you know i respect the people that have done that but i think it applies to everybody in from like life and sports as well is you gotta have that ambition and grind and that means doing the things that your other competitors or people in the sport that are not doing. That means waking up earlier, um, mastering your skill and perfecting it, working on your weaknesses, working on film, seeing what I can do to get better and putting those extra hours in to make yourself even better while other people are just like resting and like, okay, I'm just getting ready for a game. While they're doing that, you need to be putting these extra hours in and making yourself good, uh, asking those questions like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Like, or give me a good game. You can probably score, like, you know, let's say in basketball, you can score 30 points and you sit like, okay, I know I did well, but what can I do to improve? It's that ambition of always wanting to grow. And you have to um, do that because, like, the, once you start getting comfortable, that's when you really start getting setbacks. So it's always seeing ways to where you can improve and going beyond your limitations and getting outside the comfort zone. I didn't ask my question correctly, Chris. What I meant by that was in terms of like a branding perspective, what could they do to, to kind of differentiate themselves from that perspective? What, what would you do differently to what you see probably on social media nowadays? Okay, so on the branding perspective, um, the best way to brand yourself is just be yourself. I know that sounds kind of broad, but you yourself is what's going to make yourself different. So if you like certain things, put that into your story or your um, posts that you put on these social media platforms and document your everyday activities because things that you're doing yourself is going to brand you. And that's what's going to make you different and apart. So you're creating your own brand and it's going to open up different opportunities. It's because if you're just trying to 
copy what everybody else is doing, you're not really establishing your own brand. And people are like, oh, you're just like that person. But if you start pretty much putting yourself out there and being yourself, that established the difference with, um, between other people. And now you open more opportunities for yourself in the long run. But is that not difficult for an individual to do that? Because we're taught not to, in a sense, be individualistic and kind of follow the, the herd mentality. Is that quite, is that what you've got to kind of switch that off and yeah, think, well, I need to be me. It, it all goes back to mindset. And of course we all have our different culture backgrounds and things like that, because that's like, the, that's the roots, the foundation of everything. And then as you grow and learn, uh, you got to grow in your mind as well. I felt like um, the mind is the, like the core piece of everything. Like if you lost here, you're not going to grow. So you got to get outside those usual routines and do some changes because doing the same thing over and over again is a definition of sanity. So if you want to change some things up, you got to change your mindset and start thinking on a higher level. And so you got to get out of that mentality of just uh, being of course, you want to execute on things and on social media much more. But when you get to the bigger picture, you want to collaborate with other different people and just expand on that broad and get bigger connections and things like that. Because there's only so many things you can do by yourself. And is that why you've set up that production company? So you have like-minded individuals and then obviously you're going to feed off those ex- their expertise and be able to, so to speak, pass the buck over to somebody that's better than you to be able to... Uh, create that content uh, and and get that out to the uh, the, ma- the mass market. Exactly, and you get on spot on. And then um, <laughs> the funny thing is, you said is like get someone who's better than you because uh, I think a lot of times we allow our ego to get up to stop us. And if you think on the bigger picture, you do want to get them on your team because you can learn from them. And with everybody working together, it gets to a, the bigger scale. Like, even with photography, I know I do some great work. People love my work. But if someone's better, hey, hey, teach me some things. I'm open. You don't want to allow your ego to stop your growth because we can all grow in different kind of areas. Now, even champions, when they, like boxers, like when they get the championship belt and things like that, they're still trying to learn. So that goes into my production side. Like, that's maybe, I'm pretty sure, it's, I'm, actually, I'm afraid that there's always things I'm learning because, you know, the software is always changing. Um, video, photo, animation. Animation, I don't even touch. I have a person that just works on that. <laughs> I know the time. It comes to that. I'm like, look, you got that. I know that's difficult. Like, that is your, you know, your baby right there. You can handle that. So, like, I force, uh, focus on my niches and try to improve my craft and then, you know, learn from other like-minded people. So, from that perspective, Chris, your, your niche, you would have to be happy to be, in a sense, I use the word comfortable, would be more towards videography and photography then. And you won't go, you would probably say, well, yeah, I'll keep that to the one side and, and let you deal with that beast. Yes. So like, of course, like, I can learn it because, you know, going back to what I said, get outside of your comfort zone and things like that. But it's more towards the business side. You're more effective if I land that um, task to somebody else. And I can still learn because I want to know those things, but to be more effective and get things done, you, I will put, like, let's say, for example, animation on my partner because I'm my students are in photography yard. Me trying to do animation, it's like I'll slow everything down because then I got to learn everything up for scr- uh, round one. And it'd be better if I focus on my things, learn some things as he's doing it, but he's executing it at a fa- faster level and getting things, things done. And from the, pers- yeah, the perspective of the videography and photography now, you probably uh, succeed in that because they work quite nicely together because the essence of, see if I can get this right now, uh, lighting, um, what else is important? It's bad when I do photography myself. Um, what else am I missing? Uh, obviously shadow. Um, I have, yeah, that's a lot of difference. It comes from lighting, uh, camera equipment, lenses, angles, uh, the software you're using, uh, of course, the person you're working with or chemistry, uh, and when it comes to sound, you know, the audio equipment or the mics in the right locations, you don't want to have one of those clip mics. It's like all, and you're picking all that up in, the, in your recording. And then you, when you go to post editing, you're trying to clear that up when it's pretty much gone. So it's a lot of different elements uh, when it comes to these things. And that's why like, I have like a high amount of respect for people that do mass productions. And when I'm talking about that on movies, because it takes a team to actually get that done. You've got your 
uh, phot photographers, your videographers, you got the director, you got the person doing makeup, you got the person doing like the script, the person on the audio, lighting, all that comes together when it's creating a masterpiece because if everybody, it's like a, an engine, all the pieces have to work collectively to get things going. And if a lot of pieces are uh, weak and not working, you're not going to get a, a um, good end product at the end. Well, you'd probably agree with that old um, saying, there's no I in team. <laughs> exactly. And because if you do that, you're going to pretty much stunt your growth. <laughs> can only get so far. But kind of in terms of what well, I've seen some of your work, how we connect you on, on, on Instagram, it was probably, how would I put this in a nice way? Um, not envious, but I look, looked up to you from a certain perspective and it's probably reciprocated from the sporting sense thinking, well, you, I'm quite envious of you and, and, and how you put it. it, it it's mm -hmm. the simplicity is not that difficult to be able to grow your social media platform. I'm assuming you've got to have that commitment, uh, the patience and the work ethic to work at it. And then it will grow as people resonate with it. So that, that one, I think I've got it now because there's none of this fluctuation of it going up and then dropping down, which is uh, probably everybody can relate to thinking, oh, what, what have I put out there that is so, so bad that people don't like it or they're unsubscribed. And so you get kind of, I think you get used to it and kind of say, well, oh, what? Oh, well, yeah. you didn't like what I put. It's me being true to myself. So, and I haven't been active on Instagram. I think we're about a week as we record, maybe a little bit longer because of other uh, facets of the business taking more of a priority. Obviously, uh, once I get those on top of those things and get them dialed in, I can then re well, we'll call it repurpose the actual content over to, to Instagram. And it's not having to replicate the work over multiple platforms it's me putting it out on one and then reutilizing it into another platform so say with the likes of this i can put this over multiple platforms be we are talking on video i could go to youtube facebook uh instagram um which one am i missing twitter and then obviously oh. the all, and then the all, <laughs> audio is twitter uh, and the podcast. So it, th th this notion that you have to regurgitate content, you don't have to do it. The simplicity if you do it once, there you go. How many, how many ways can you repurpose it? So I think until I learned that, you're thinking, ah, the single, simple things are so easy. But, yeah. when, but it, it takes hearing it from somebody else to actually action that. And it takes, like, especially when it comes to building up social media, it takes a lot of commitment and things like that. Like, uh, for example, uh, most of my growth on my social media was through my college times. <laughs> but I just kept going, and from there, it just never stopped. So, like, in between classes, and, of course, I did my studies and all that, I was, like, on this person tweeting. <laughs> people were like, what are you doing? Oh, do I, do I get you back to you. It's just, just that constant thing. And a lot of people... Um, you want to, a lot of people want to go the easier route, but you don't uh, reach the people that you need to and get that organic, uh, organic reach and then relationships if you do um, if you do the quick way besides or the right way. And that means commenting, tweeting, uh, tweeting people, DM people, and things like that, and making those uh, established relationships. Now it's going to take a lot longer, and I know we live in a microwave society where everybody wants things quick, but in the long game, you will gain so much. You will surpass them. It's like right now you're. Like you're going against like the rabbit or the turtle, but eventually, you know, you're going to pretty much win the race. So you got to stay committed to those. Now, of course, with social media, you know, I can go on for days with that because there's so many parts to it. Like, and it's, it's like an ongoing thing, but it's just the main thing is branding yourself, pushing out a lot of content, being consistent, uh, giving value to the people um, while you're making these posts and not just making it all about me, 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 <laughs> which I know you want to do, but when you're giving value to people on your posts, uh, naturally they want to share it into other people, and that's how you uh, expand your reach to other places as well. Now, uh, kind of dip into a little bit, which is a lot more longer discussion. Uh, of course, you want to use like uh, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, uh, 
target specific audience and things like that to stay consistent. It's like commercial and things like that. But the main thing is just staying consistent, collaborating, and actually contacting these people instead of just posting to say, oh, no, okay, I'm gone. Actually communicate with these people because you never know that person may be helping as an influencer to your post. Well, I think it, it probably resonates probably to the to, to, to more the maybe the collegiate athlete or the pro athlete where you could tie the example of, you know, the, the, the turtle and the hair because there's that notion of once that athlete makes it, everybody comes out the woodwork. It's like, oh, you've yes. made it now. I want a piece of that. So you're thinking, well, you want to be um, respectful, respectful of where you've come from but within a certain regard because it's like, well, you're close family. Yeah. Mm. But not go beyond that. And, and it's trying to say, um, this will be like a little bit the opposite of what we said in terms of all about me, 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 but at times you do need to think about yourself. Oh, you, uh, most definitely. Not. So let me go ahead. Like, of course you want to take care of yourself because you are in the living this life. So you do, um, I kind of got to be careful with it because I know some of me people have so many different perspectives on different words, but you have to be just a little bit of self because you got to take care of yourself. You got to have mm-hmm. confidence in yourself. You got to do things to take care of you because it's like that analogy. It's like before I didn't help somebody else, got to make sure I take myself on or like in the, the airplane, you got to put your mask on before you help others. And as an athlete, you know, you, you want to make sure you take care of yourself and your family before you reach out to others because like, you got to make sure that foundation is strong. Well, it's very true, especially in American sport, because nothing, well, bar, I think the NBA, nothing's guaranteed unless you're a quarterback. And, and uh, well, uh, be, both of us being from black backgrounds, it's like, well, the likelihood of you being a quarterback now is probably going to be up and up because just the way it is, because it's more athletic, the sport all round. But then historically, that's not the case, but I think maybe that's why there is more, and this is maybe generalizing a little bit, more of those type of athletes being their late 20s, early 30s, because that's that stigmatization, stigmatization their parents had in the 60s and, and earlier on that, okay, a black athlete is lesser, a lesser being than a white one. And you're thinking, well that's maybe why they have that chip on their shoulder to want to achieve. And maybe why oh, we'll use the example of Antonio Brown's maybe fallen off the, wa- the wagon, so to speak with now he's got all that money. Mm-hmm. He it's all about me. It's I could care less about the team. I've got, I've, I've made it, but then if he actually had to look himself in the eye as him coming out of college, I bet you the college athlete wouldn't be too impressed. It's like, well, I worked hard to get where I'm at. I don't like how I'm going to turn out. So, okay, those are a little bit parallel universes, but I think the better way of looking at things, if you can be content with wanting to, and I don't know where I've seen this post, I think it was like Goldcast or something like that, in terms of a film star talking about it, his role model he wanted to be was when he was 20 he wanted to look up to what he was going to be like in his 30s when he got to his 30s he wanted to look up to his 40s so I think that's a great one to 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 resonate with because you don't have to aspire to be somebody else which I think from any field within society you kind of do because like well I want to be like so and so but in all honesty, like you touched upon, Chris, if you can work alongside like-minded people, learn from their expertise and bring something different uh, from your perspective, well, somebody else will will want to quote unquote emulate you. And you could say, well, there's no point being, oh, who would have said, who said it? I think Kobe Bryant said it best. I don't want to be the next Michael Jordan. I want to be the next Kobe. So it's like, Kobe. well, here's, here's in a sense, and I don't know how early on in, he said that in his career. Well, he's a brand in himself just by his first name. So, uh, it's the same with LeBron. Okay, his maybe his meteoric rise is 
maybe a little bit higher, but it's, you don't have to ride somebody else's coattails to get up to, to be successful. You could probably learn from them. And and by all means, those are probably successful people because they're willing to help you out because they've gone through those hardships, those struggles that you are going through. So they're going to kind of give you that helping hand up. Whereas maybe the lesser people, and that's no disrespect to them who think they've arrived are going to, and you probably have seen this in the business world. Wow. You're going to pay for my time. It's you know, no freebies here. Whereas I think people further up the, the ladder, as long as they've got the time to be able to send an email, uh, send a reply to a tweet, uh, a DM on Facebook or Instagram, they'll do it because it's like, well, I've been in your shoes. However many years previous that would be. Um, I think, and you, you, we talked about this off air via social media in terms of my story. That's one of the reasons when I've stopped doing the elite level sport, that's exactly what I wanted to do with the younger athletes. Well, let me be your guiding light, uh, your source of, I won't say inspiration or aspiration, but let me help you kind of deviate through some of that adversity and not make it as hard a challenge. I think maybe on, on a catch 22, maybe some of them probably could do it facing some of that adversity because you could say to a lesser degree, the younger generation, be it in their early twenties and, and younger, a lot of it's already given to them. It's like, well, I had to, I won't say, I had to earn it, but enough to, I wouldn't say I had it easier than say the generation before because the British athletes are on, are on funding. So we get paid. You talk about the generation before that, they had to have a job and do athletics. So I'm probably in honor and admiration of being for them to be able to do that. Cause that's like, it's like, not fantasy, but it's like, well, how did you manage to balance a full-time job or a part-time job? And in a sense, the athletic side, which is a full-time job as well, together and not get injured uh, and be able to perform, perform on an optimal level. Whereas you think everybody else post uh, at the Atlanta Games in 96, that's their job. I have to, I get up in the morning, I have breakfast, I train whatever time that may be, whatever sport it is, lunch. And it's, it's not a luxury because you want to do it and you have to work hard to stay at that level. But it's not as difficult as it was in the past. So to be able to instill that kind of uh, willpower and fortitude to the younger athletes, I didn't know how to do it at first, but because you're thinking, well, if I tell you how to do it, you're going to come back at me and say, well, I don't want to hear what you've got to say. Whereas I, I think, think that's the, one of those times where, um, <laughs> like someone would coach, it's like, you get, an athlete has to get punched in the mouth. And when I'm saying that, they have to fight, um, go against competitors. Like, they get so confident and comfortable, and then all of a sudden they get, like, in game day or something like that, and they're struggling. And it's just switched their minds to it's like everybody else was easy and now I'm going against this team or this person. Why am I struggling so much? And it just uh, kind of forms that um, it makes a, the athlete more coachable. Uh, you always want to be able to uh, grow and learn. That's kind of what I uh, said on earlier, but even in the athletic sport, uh, you always want to be coachable and learning things. And that, that's happening in all sports, American or throughout the worldwide where you see athletes get comfortable and all of a sudden it just takes that one team or person kind of knock them out or like put them like, oh, shoot, I'm on edge. I maybe underestimated this person. And then it shifts the mindset. It's like, oh, crap, I should have done more earlier and never underestimated my opponent. I would have been in a better situation. It just, it just at times takes an athlete to kind of get, as I say, punch in the mouth to kind of switch that around where they kind of, they just they get it. <laughs> 
Well, I would echo that, Chris, because I think with me, it's not athletics that's kind of punched me in the mouth. It's the he- my health. It's be because I didn't take care of what, in a sense, well, some people are probably horrified what will come out of my mouth, but in a sense of what is built on my identity, the uh, taking care of my body from a fitness and nutritional perspective, because of the job I, well, I'm doing for, uh, for another another few weeks now in school school because of the stress of that environment i went way off the the beaten path and and i started well sleep kind of went out the window it was kind of a yeah. um how would i say it i would okay i'm living in europe but i'm operating on your times that well not houston per se in texas but working on america maybe about eastern time you're thinking well how you can't operate like that for god how many, i think i did that for like six months and i think to myself now on reflection well no wonder you had mental health issues when it came to when it came time to it because you were that stressed out and you didn't do the things you what the things that the things that you i probably took for granted for 30 plus well so say 25 years for granted because it was just the norm for me. It was people I, I hung around. Um, it was a lifestyle. I'd like to say choice because um, I never had problems with eating vegetables as a youngster. Um, a lot of parents were envious of, of mine and say, well, how do you get him to eat these vegetables? Because he, he, he likes them. It's, it's, it's one of those things. It wasn't, I think I can't remember how old I was when I had a chocolate bar. I think it was about three, four. And I didn't know what to do with it because I'd never seen it before. Whereas you think of nowadays, and there's no judgment on the parents, it's probably to what on one hand quiet the kids down and on the other hand it's facilitating their need for sugar. They give it that because they can't well, they perceive they calm down. It's like, well, they will do for maybe a few minutes and then it's going to go straight back. The energy level is going to go straight through the roof again. And you, 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 you don't, you, you can't see it. Well, I was thinking, and I think I was at a food festival a couple of months ago with my mother and the, the parents were talking amongst themselves about, Oh, when I give my kids sugar, uh, I realized they were hyper thinking, well, uh, we oper we operate in a sense, on sugar, which is just called a carbohydrate. It's just not um, in a simple to uh, simple form of what a chocolate bar is. And I think somebody read when I was at work before we broke up for a half term, which is called over here. They were like this little drink that's regulated by the the school board. Mm-hmm. It had sixteen grams of sugar in it. You're thinking. And that's allowed in a school. You're thinking, yeah. I didn't pipe up. I was like, I'm not surprised. It, and um, it, let me uh, pivot in a little bit because it's um, a mixture, of course, cultural, and then on top of that, habits. So I'm going to try to hit on both of them. I started with, with habits, like when we were talking about mental health and things like that. Um, and this was an eye awakening for me because I'm not going to lie. Like in, a little bit early before you started talking or like, uh, communicating on my Instagram, I used to like grind, 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 grind. And then people were like, man, you look exhausted. <laughs> they could tell by <laughs> Well, you can't. You can. I'm, saying, I'm saying that to be honest, but, like, um, it takes a little bit of wisdom, like, a, and then learn less. You got to bump your head. But I read and then listened to other, like, podcasts, things like that. And one thing that kind of I often, like, people, like, you heard of an uh, entrepreneur by the name of Dame John, FUBU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's going and back so, some like, years. That's listening. going back some years, that is. That, yeah, that yeah, man, I haven't heard that in a long time. I know, but uh, from entrepreneurs like him and other interviews I listened to, one thing they said, and they shocked me, is like, yeah, um, and these people are like making six figures, millions, like, yeah, I get eight hours of sleep. And I was like, what? <laughs> and the thing that they explain is like, okay, I, I got to make sure I take care of myself, my, my health and all that, and much more, so I got to make sure I get my rest. The thing that makes uh, the difference is when I'm up, I'm being productive. I'm like, I'm make, taking advantage of every hour and time and things like that, but I'm still taking care of myself, make sure I'm getting the rest. 
I'm still like, you know, treat myself every once in a while for like achieving accomplishments. I'm still having family time, sort of happy. And happiness is a thing, I think a thing that needs to be put more um, out there more because happiness is something that needs to be talked about because a lot, you see a lot of like, younger and old, you know, mentally like struggling because they're not happy. So you want to make sure you're taking yourself, you know, treating yourself, you know, for your goals. Cause you know, this is a marathon, it's not just a sprint. Uh, so you can not get burned out and, you know, still have those family time and things like that so that overall you are happy. And uh, going back to the other part of the conversation you were talking about, like, you know, sugar and things like that, that's it, very interesting because, you know, with so many clashes that the cultures, uh, stereotypes and things like that, this is the certain amount, I mean, right amount of sugar and things like that. It's all different per country. So um, it's like the, um, that professor says, like, um, I always stay open-minded and, um, never just like uh, judge because you know so many people have different perspectives and regulations and things and if you just stay open-minded to kind of listen to understand and just li- instead of listen to answer you become more of a well-rounded person so of course i know like on the, the street laws like on traffic are different from like food regulations uh the way our governments are different and things like that and if you just stay open-minded communication becomes a lot more better well, I think, and I've always said further than that, Chris, because I think if you have that sense of being open-minded, I think in any sphere that you enter, you'll be, you'll be able to, you talk about that well-rounded person, I think you're better at being able to, one, come up with a solution, two, you're a better listener, so you, you are going to be able to, well, okay, I can get that person's point of view, let me listen to somebody over here and see if we can't bounce off an idea and make it better. Whereas if you kind of go into with that perspective of, oh, they'll use the analogy of the horse with blinkers and it's, I'm going to focus solely on myself. That's where I think the ideology doesn't work because it's thinking, well, if you take that for face value, I'm going to have my blinkers on. Well, you're going to block everything out. You're not going to listen to anything. You're just going yeah, to be, boom. that's gonna... where a lot of people clash at because it's like, this is the right way. Your way is wrong without even considering the other person because they may have a good solid point or you may both have a good solid point. And then it's just come back to what you're saying, like find a solution or like a nice medium of where you can still work together. Because um, just like, um, I'm going to go back to, I want, trying to see the best way I can put it. Well, let's say a team. A team of any sports has only different background skills and things like that. Their weaknesses and strength, but working together, they are able to achieve and win games. So I kind of use that analogy into life. Well, it's, it's, it's working as a collective. It's, it's working as one unit because, well, in a sense, a fo- good functioning team works on communication. If you're able to communicate that you are, will use the analogy of basketball was a little bit easier. If you get beaten, you shout help. It, that's that's not, it's it's normal. It's uh, okay. You may not do that in um. Well, you're less likely to do it in a business sense. Um, maybe outside the sporting arena, you, you you won't do as well because it's like well, it's sh- it perceived as as a sign of weakness. But if you are struggling, be it mental health, um, you are not quite at a level that you are comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. We did it as children. We had no problem then. And, and uh, I feel like a lot of times we forget like the little basic stuff and like foundations because like when we were kids and we were learning, we asked, "What is this? How does this work?" And, but doing that is how we learn. I don't know. I think it's like the probably like stereotypes, like, I don't know what it is. Or probably even pride or ego. When you get to a certain age or level, it's like, oh, I don't need no help. And that's when you slowly start to decline because you're preventing other information from that you possibly need to grow and you're preventing that. Well, I'll go a step further and I use myself, be it from a high school level or even collegiate. Oh, somebody else will ask that question. And most of the time that never happens. It'd be, oh, maybe I should have asked it. And there's, and, and there's that analogy that goes, there is no stupid question. 
because it's simple to somebody. Goes, then it goes to that phrase, even genius is asking questions. <laughs> so people who have made a major impact into a society ask questions. So it's like, if they're asking questions, why aren't you? <laughs> I think it's a difficult one because it's, it, you don't want to be, on the one hand, stigmatized. Uh, you've got that peer pressure. Um, what would be the other one? But those two will play a major impact, more specifically at the high school level, because it's like, well, I don't want people to take the piss out of me or, or be a laughing joke, uh, laughing stock of the class. And let but, me kind of freeze you on that real quick, because I feel like a lot of times, and you have a good solid point on that, but I feel like people take that from like mm-hmm. what, what went on in high school until they're after you know, school into real life. And it prevents them from doing things. Like people are being like, oh, I don't want to do this because I may be judged or this person may criticize me or people may laugh at me or I don't want my family to think down on me. And it creates that fear. And if the crazy thing is, is um, I guess the best way I can phrase it, we create our own fear. It is like you can actually execute on these things. But inside your mind, you're telling me, you're telling yourself, Oh, I don't want to do this because my mom made me say something. Oh, I don't want to do this because my friends will say something. You're creating your own barriers <laughs> instead of just doing it. And I, that's I, at times I think that's where uh, people see you can at times become your own worst enemy if you don't watch it because you're allowing uh, the opinions of others and then you're self doubting yourself and you're slowing any kind of things that you want to do actually in life. Uh, I think uh, now we have to slowly get out of that and just learn how to be most importantly confident with our and excellent things and at times you know just have the confidence to say like you know what you may not like it but i know this is my passion this is my drive this is what i meant to, this is what i meant to do so i'm going to do it and just get into that mindset of just executing because a lot of people and it's very common don't do things because they're so worried about outside opinions no, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how what level the people are. Most of the people have had to overcome that, uh, myself included. I think I shunned away from Facebook Lives from, we're gonna talk about ye- for years because of, and it wasn't until recently a coach of mine said, well, what are, what are your, not your deepest fears, but what are some of the things you've had to overcome or people have said to you and you can go as far back as you wanted to. I went back to, I think, me as a kid, and, and, I, and I didn't go into everything. And that, uh, op- being open with people, I did it for, tw- I did, tw- okay, it wasn't a Facebook, it was a recording for, for the group, but that was 20 minutes long. Mine was the longest, and I could have kept going. Um, but I think until I'd done that, the notion where I had, where, and I talk about that stigmatization and, and the, People um, having a, not having a go at you, but making you a laughing joke, making a laughing stock of you, happened at the elite level, and I and it was only, I think it was like a promotional video for the sport, and I didn't, I kind of introduced myself, such and such. Okay, the way I did it was not, not the best, but I've taken that on board as face value. Oh, I'm not very good at it. And it's taken me, well, six, five, six years to get over. It's like, well, you can do, you can do it. Hearing the, the higher ones talk of B E T, the hip hop preacher, he talk about, I think he did a face, um, an Instagram video on it a few, I think months ago in terms of like when he gets the negative comment, he just thought, yeah, here you go. Put that in the cra- in the trash. I don't <laughs> care about it. Or um, I think Gary V, he loves it. It's like, Oh yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I think it's, Oh, what, 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 what? And, he, and he'll cuss it out. If he, what, what, sh- what, how bad a shitty a day have you had to put that garbage <laughs> on my feet? And he, and he laughs about it. It's like, well, I think I had somebody, give me some feedback on my on this podcast a while back and they kind of wrote back oh i hope you don't take it personally no i asked for the feedback that's that's fine that's that's i see that as positive criticism you don't like it that's fine but then the people she was 
uh, spouting off that she listened to, I never even heard of. So I was thinking, well, okay, that's maybe not, we're not on the, the same level from that perspective. It wouldn't maybe work as you're not the right audience. So maybe that's why you don't like it. But some of the, the critique points she had were valid. It's like, yeah, by all means, this was, uh, like the intro is slightly too long. So people get bored. It's like, that's fair enough. We're working on that to make that better. Um, I think I had a, somebody else said to me that your voice at the, in the intro is not very enthusiastic. So I was like, I've got to take... I've got to take it from two points of view. Okay, the person is is an American, so you guys um, generally, like in- stereotypically, are up here all the time in speaking, yeah. whereas, okay, I'm half American, so I think maybe that's why I go up occasionally, and it'd be yeah, randomly cool. when it does it. It was in fairness. Yeah, I took on board. Yeah, yeah. And I listened to it last night before I edited the one that's recently gone out yeah it's 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 because of the time of day you've done it so the, the energy level is a little bit lower so i'll take that on board as that's that's criticism it's fair it's he's, he's right it's the the level could be higher but then if i go too far and people that know me oh james that's an act that's n- no way like you that's like that all the time and it, it goes back to that thing of just being yourself uh, from the your energy and things like that, you know who you are. Uh, just stick with that. And then on top of that, like you can't name a single person who hasn't had critics. Like even the most successful movies, athletes, uh, artists, geniuses, uh, leaders, you name it, had critics. Well, you can go. You can probably go you know, from uh, sports, but um, not sports production. Um, oh, what do you call that type of media? Um, Sports show host so be uh, Skip Bayless or oh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> or oh, who's the other one? Um, Smith and Skip were like uh, two popular ones on ESPN, I think. So you either, I think, with those type of people, you either you either love them or you hate them. Honestly. And they have a perfect. That's the perfect example because <laughs> I'm laughing at because Stephen A. Smith. We know his energy is way up there. He'd be like, "What? What? Like you said this? Are you kidding me?" Like, are you like? Have you watched it? Like, that's his energy. It's way up there. And Skip would be like, "Well, I looked at the stats. <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> you have someone energy is way up there. He's like, have you looked at this? It's <laughs> like, it's like, let me slow you back down. <laughs> but when they're on the show together, I feel like it works because either you're gonna like one person or you're gonna like the other one, and you bring both audience to the table because someone's going to pick their favorite. It's like rooting on your favorite team. And that actually gets the show rating and ratings. And then a lot of uh, feedback and reviews and traction because, you know, their differences is what actually brings people together. Well, that's probably maybe why they've gone the separate ways in terms of like more recently with, um, well, Skip Bayless going over to Fox and that's no plug for them. But uh, <laughs> in, ter- in terms of from that perspective, and it's probably the same with Shannon Sharp. It's it's very much, it's maybe a different one. It's the journalist versus the, the well, okay, the, the retired athlete, but it's two sides of the fence from that argument perspective. So, and he's going to have his uh, little clicks and then, well, the, probably the argument of, well, LeBron comes up but from time to time as, is he the greatest? I think that comment he came up with, like, what was it, this side of Christmas? Okay. I perceive myself as it's probably from a, a affirmation point of view or self talk. It's one thing to say it to yourself, but to say it in the mass media, you're going to get slayed. So it's like, well, what? Who are you to think that you are the be- the best? I think that argument is like apple comparing apples to oranges. Like, well, you could say, well, the sport is night and day between what it's NBA now to what it was in the nineties. You could say the same or what it was in the seventies, the sixties that they're, they're not, the, the game is evolved every single time. So to compare those athletes, I think the easier argument would be they were the greatest of their era. 
and then that's the end and, of the story. And I know, like, when it comes to that, the debate's going to go on because people have going to go back and forth. Uh, um, like Michael Jordan, LeBron, Kobe. I believe everybody has different eras, and the sport has some tremendous change. Just like the NFL is completely different than what it was, like, in the 80s, 70s, where it is now. And then on top of that, when you went on the part of, like, you know, the affirmation, like, even Muhammad Ali, I mean, he was known for that. I mean, I forgot the exact fight. I'll keep myself ahead for this. But he went into the mass media and said to their face, like, I am the greatest. And people were like, is he crazy? And, like, if you look at this, like, you, you're some the one to lose this fight. He said, no, I am the greatest. I'm going to prove it. And, um, I think it's a nice little balance because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You got to have confidence in yourself to execute on a high level like that because you're going to face a uh, huge amount of criticism. And then it's kind of funny when you mention that because even in my say boxing, um, <laughs> I have a tremendous amount of respect for this person. I don't always agree with attitude. Uh, I'm being honest, but I respect him as an athlete in the sport. Uh, it's like Mayweather. I mean, he is known for being that cocky son of a gun. <laughs> but when it comes to boxing, it's one of those things like it's very aggravating because I guess because attitude, but it's confidence and he knows what he's doing. Like, he will pretty much outdance you, especially in the defensive stand, or, like, counter-punching, and just get the numbers and hits and needs to be more accurate. He knows what he's doing. Well, I think, well, you, you talked about Muhammad Ali. Well, he's the originator of probably that that brashness, the uh, sense of, well, I'm going to say it like it is, and everybody else in the modern era is copying it. So it's, it's nothing new. He was the first athlete to be content to use that platform to get, well, this is how I feel. Let me put it out there. And, and, and it's, it's affirmation in your face. It's, it's, it's him speaking it out. It's what he believes. And that's the easiest way of believing it. Cause when you say it out loud, yeah, it must be true. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is this, it's like, in the, beginning stage people are like oh you're crazy but once you prove it you're a genius or you're like one of the greatest it's like taking and then you know it's all about taking risks because you got to take risks to grow it's like that he took the risk of saying it and he put himself out there but when you say it or put yourself out there like that and you actually do it they're like wow okay you got a point <laughs> this is like the critics slowly start they're not gonna stop coming but they're slowly starting backing up like okay you, you're and my penultimate question to you, Chris, is in your opinion, if somebody wanted to change or challenge their perception of their mindset, how would they go about doing that? Go a little bit more in depth, like, like wing your mindset, because I want to make sure I answer your question. <sighs> Just the way they perceive things in general be to, to be a perception towards some, what we talked about in terms of work ethic, uh, just just a, a sense of to make themselves better on a daily basis would probably be the easiest okay, way. So when it comes to that, I think the first and utmost thing is uh, know yourself completely. Like, know who you are. And then know what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and at that moment, don't allow anything to stop you at that point. And then as you, like, you know, the foundation, knowing who you are, know what you're you, you're uh, your dreams and aspirations and where you want to go to. And then you kind of fill in the pieces of getting the right influences, the mentor, the coaches and things like that to help you get to that path. Because, you know, we all have ups and downs, but it all starts from, of course, the, like I said earlier, the mind. And with you being around that circle constantly all the time, you're going to, can you assume it? Yeah, take it, we'll take it anyway, back out of call. But um, you want to keep that energy surrounded with you so, like, because, uh, you know, in daily life, you're going to face these challenges and obstacles and things like that. So you've got to have constant, you know, reestablishments of that so you can keep going in the long run of the marathon. And my final question to you, Chris, before we wrap up the show, if we, you, had, we had, you had to summarize what we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? You would put it in one sentence. All right, I'm just going to freestyle out. Know your dream, know your work, go after it, and do anything possible to make it happen. 
I think that's some wise words to live by, Chris. So once again, thanks again for coming on the cast. Thank you for your opportunity. Oh, the pleasure has been all mine. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let Chris and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at Chris Holmes underscore underscore and at James O Roberts 11. You can do the same on Twitter and Facebook. And again, do check out his podcast, Next Level Thinking. And again, do check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk forward slash free dash resources. Make sure to check those out. The links will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipson.com under the category general. So once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.